We will uh, now recognize our second panel. I will introduce them as a whole, then we will take the oath and begin the questioning. And let me welcome you and thank you for, uh, for not only being here, but also for letting the children go first and uh, uh, perhaps go back to school, or maybe not. Uh, Mr. Kevin Chavis is the chairman of the Black Alliance for Education Options. Mr. Chavis is also a former D.C. City Council member and a former chairman of the Education Committee. Dr. Patrick Wolf is a professor and 21st Century Chair in School Choice, Department of Education Reform at the University of Arkansas. Dr. Wolf was the principal investigator for impact evaluation of the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program through a contract with the United States Department of Education. Ms. Betty North is the Principal and CEO of the Preparatory School of the District of Columbia. Dr. Ramona Edelin is the Executive Director of the D.C. Association of Public Charter Schools. Um, welcome to you all. And I will administer the oath. Uh, I would ask you to please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you, and you may be seated. Uh, thanks to all four of you. I will um, recognize myself for minutes, and then I will recognize uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, Dr. Edlin, is it, were you present for the first panel? We do opening statements again? Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. If you couldn't tell, it's my first <laughs> on, and if you can't tell yet, you will before it's all said and done. Uh, so, uh, despite my over eagerness to uh, ask questions, we really would rather hear from you. So, we will start with you, Mr. Chavis, and we will go in order from my left to right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Davis and Congresswoman Norton, members of the committee. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify before you today. With your indulgence, I would like to use my time this morning to offer some perspective about the importance of the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program, not just for district residents, but also as it relates to the national fight to ensure that each and every American school child receive a high-quality education. As you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, I served on the Council of the District of Columbia for 12 years, and over half of that time I chaired the Council's Education Committee. I am proud of the fact that during my chairmanship I was able to help usher school choice into the district, first by way of charter schools and then through the Opportunity Scholarship Program. As to the creation of the Opportunity Scholarship Program, let me be very clear. Mr. Chairman, this program was not forced upon or foisted on the residents of the District of Columbia. I know I was there. The three-sector initiative was a collaborative undertaking between the City and the Federal Government. We insisted on the three-sector approach, which provided equal funding for D.C. public schools, D.C. public charter schools, and the OSP. We worked very hard, and when I say we, I mean then Mayor Tony Williams, School Board President Peggy Cooper Kafritz and I, we worked very, very hard to develop a program that fit the unique educational needs of the district, where not one dime was diverted from public schools. Anyone who says, suggests otherwise is being fundamentally and practically dishonest about the history and origin of the OSP. Today, the students who testified have spoken directly about the positive impact of the OSP on their lives. For them and thousands of other district children, the OSP has been a lifeline for not just them, but for their families. Without this program, as Ronald Halasi said, they wouldn't have made it. It is just that simple. The D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program sends a clear message to families, to children, and to our community. If you are low income, if you are stuck in a school that is failing, that is unsafe, and that no amount of money can fix right away, we are not going to make an experiment of you. We are going to help you. And we are not going to do, we're going to do it not five years from today, but today. We are going to give you a chance of success. And the essence of the program is in its name, Opportunity. The D.C. 
provided scholarships allowing the lowest income D.C. children to attend better schools, private schools that are mere blocks away from the public schools that long ago stopped serving their needs. The program is open to everyone. There is no discrimination. There is no cherry picking. And the results are stunning. Graduation rates are 91 percent for those who use the scholarships. That is 42 percent higher than the public schools, traditional public schools. Improved reading scores for students. Parental satisfaction is overwhelming. And the U.S. Department of Education, as you will hear from Patrick Wolf, said that the program was one of the most effective programs they have ever studied. By any measure, by any test, by any rational standard, this hearing should be about how we can expand this program not in Washington, D.C., but in other parts of the Nation. Instead, by a cruel twist of political fate, we are here trying to save the very program that should be a model for our country. Which leads me to the final point I need to make during this testimony, the importance of the OSP in the larger national education reform landscape. Since leaving the Council, I have been deeply immersed in the national education reform movement. Indeed, I have become a student, a student of what ails our schools and what does or what does not work for our kids. The truth is, we know how to educate children. We know what works for them. But often we don't have the will or courage to truly put our children first when we make policy that affects them. Plus, our overallegiance to a one-size-fits-all approach to system reform has blinded us to the reality of many of today's kids' lives. Yes, we need to fix D.C. public schools and many other school districts around the country, but we also need to save individual children today, children who can't wait for the three to five year reform plan du jour. During the Civil Rights Movement, Dr. Martin Luther King talked about the fierce urgency of now. People should not have to wait to get their freedom, he argued. They are entitled to those freedoms now, not in the distant future. Today we are engaged in a similar freedom fight, one involving ensuring that all American children receive the education that they deserve. Like Dr. King's battle cry, our children are entitled to receive a quality education today not tomorrow. The D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program has responded to that clarion call by offering a quality education to children in this city who otherwise would be trapped in failing schools. I applaud those of you on this committee who support this reauthorization and urge all of you to join us in this fight to educate each and every child by any means necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chavis. Uh, Dr. Wolf will recognize you now for your five-minute opening statement. Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Davis, distinguished members, I am pleased to be with you today to discuss my professional judgment regarding what we know about the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program, or OSP. I served as the principal investigator of the research team hired by the U.S. Department of Education to conduct an independent evaluation of the OSP. Since lotteries determined if eligible students did or did not receive an Opportunity Scholarship, we were able to use a gold standard experimental research design to determine what impact the OSP had on participants. What did we find? The students in our study graduated from high school at significantly higher rates as a result of the OSP. As portrayed in Exhibit 1, using an opportunity scholarship increased the likelihood of a student graduating by 21 percentage points, from 70 percent to 91 percent. In scientific terms, we are more than 99 percent confident that access to school choice through the Opportunity Scholarship Program was the reason why OSP students graduated at these much higher rates. Students who applied to the program from public schools that had been labeled in need of improvement were the highest service priority of the OSP. They graduated at a rate that was 20 percentage points higher as a result of using a scholarship. Evidence that students achieved higher test scores due to the OSP is somewhat less conclusive than the evidence that they graduated at higher rates. Our analysis of test score data across all years of the study suggests that OSP students likely benefited academically from the program in reading, but probably not in math. The statistical probability that the OSP reading gains we observed were somehow false discoveries of mere statistical noise, was 9 percent after two years, 1 percent after three years, and 6 percent after four years. We had set 5 percent uncertainty, 
or 95 percent confidence as the critical level for judging an observed difference to be a conclusive impact of the program. The reading gains from the OSP exceeded that high bar in year three of the study, but fell just short by one percentage point in the final year, when hundreds of students had graduated out of the study and therefore shrunk our sample. Skeptics might claim that the positive impacts of the Opportunity Scholarship Program on reading achievement in the final analysis are not real, but there is only a 6 percent chance that we would have observed such test score gains for the OSP students if, in fact, the program had no effect. Parents were more satisfied with their child's school as a result of the OSP. The proportion of parents who assigned a high grade of A or B to their child's school was 10 percentage points higher based on scholarship use by their child. We can be 99 percent confident this was a true impact of the program. Parents also viewed their children as safer in school if they participated in the OSP. The U.S. Department of Education's National Center for Education Evaluation, or NCEE, has sponsored a total of 14 experimental studies of education programs, including our study of the OSP. Nine of the other 13 evaluations of such interventions as student mentoring, reading programs, and teacher training reported no statistically significant impacts of the program on any student outcome in any year. Another study of an after-school initiative found that the program had negative effects on student reading achievement that balanced out positive effects on math. The clear positive impact of the OSP on high school graduation makes it one of only four educational programs to demonstrate effectiveness in an experiment sponsored by the NCEE and it generated the second largest positive impact uncovered to date. Moreover, the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program has proven effective at boosting the outcome that matters most, educational attainment. President Obama, in a speech to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce one year ago today, stated emphatically that graduating from high school is an economic imperative. Both the President and Secretary Duncan have stressed the importance of raising the graduation rate because graduating from high school is closely associated with a variety of positive personal and social outcomes, including higher lifetime earnings and lower rates of unemployment and crime. Since each additional high school graduate saves the Nation an average of $260,000 due to increased taxes on higher earnings and lower law enforcement costs, the 449 additional high school graduates due to the operation of the OSP will save our Nation over $116 million, meaning the program more than pays for itself. The research record on the first federally sponsored K-12 scholarship program is filled with good news. The students definitely are graduating at much higher rates. They appear to be reading better. Parents are more satisfied and live in less fear for their child's safety. Now it is up to Congress and the President to decide if additional disadvantaged families in our Nation's capital should receive access to the benefits from this demonstrably successful education program. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. Uh, now we will recognize Ms. North for her five-minute opening statement. Hello, distinguished members of the committee. My name is Betty Fenwick North, and I am the founder of Preparatory School of the District of Columbia. The Preparatory School of the District of Columbia is a licensed nonprofit um, private educational institute. We opened our doors in 1984 as a child development center and over the last 26 years as a result of the needs of our parents and students have expanded then from now to then to the 10th grade. Our mission is to give our students the academic foundation that would allow them to be successful in life in a safe, caring, and structured environment that utilizes the small classroom learning. We provide, the, we provide the intimate attention that a lot of today's youth require in order to reach the educational aptitude necessary for success. Our wonderful staff is able to adopt to each student's unique cognitive learning style while placing emphasis on analyzing reading, language, articulation, and writing. In addition to the academic, it is the aim of the Preparatory School of D.C. to assist the character building, development, and the ability to preserve integrity and respect for themselves and their community. 
The Preparatory School of D.C. is a family first school. We strive to instill good family values in each of our students. A majority of our students come from low income families. A number of our families have uh, multiple ch children, Claus, who are close to school age, would not have the opportunity to receive an education, uh, an education from a private institute if it were not for the Opportunity Scholarship. The Opportunity Scholarship Program has made it possible for many low-income families to have more options to achieve and acquire edu quality education. Over 150 students have been able to attend the Preparatory School of D.C. solely because of the Opportunity Scholarship Program, an opportunity that has provided a sound and enriching educational experience. Students who attend the Preparatory School of D.C. ranges from those taking AP courses to uh, those students who have, have been diagnosed as learning disabilities, as well as those who has been documented disciplinary problems that have involved the courts. And as many parents, if they were able to testify, would all tell you, as they have constantly told us and we have heard from them, if it were not for the Opportunity Scholarship Program, many of these students would not have had, the, would not have been able to experience and discover that they are not just a statistics, they are individuals who need and can and have meet, that has needs that will be met. Today's children are our future. Let us help you guide them and prepare them for the next level. The more op options we provide these parents and their families, the better choices they can make for their, for their situations, and the better choices they make, the better their chances of success. In closing, I would like to say that I believe the Opportunity Scholarship has opened doors for parents to have choices for their children's education, has empowered parents with the necessary financial sources to become more involved and influential in their child's and their children's education, and the Opportunity Scholarship has provided students and exposed the experience and the academic culture that private, religious, secular schools offer. At the end of the day, parents of youth who come from financially stable families have choices in which schools they would like to attend. Why can't parents of youth who come from low-income homes also have the same choices provided to them through the Opportunity Scholarship? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. North. Uh, we will recognize Dr. Adelin for her five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Davis, Congresswoman Norton, other members of the committee. I am Ramona Edelin, Executive Director of the D.C. Association of Chartered Public Schools, the membership organization that represents the interest of public charter schools in D.C. I am honored to come before you today to share the progress and the promise of public charter schools in Washington, D.C. You may be well aware that the U.S. Congress helped to create the environment for charter schools in D.C. with the passage of the School Reform Act of 1995. The number of students enrolled in D.C. charter schools has grown steadily from a few hundred students in 1996 to one of the largest concentrations in any city in the country. Currently, our charter schools serve about 28,000 students which comprises 38 percent of all of the public school children. And this number is expected to increase in the fall. D.C. charter schools serve students of all ages and abilities from three years old to adult learners. During the 2009-10 school year, 87 percent of charter school students were African American, 9 percent were Latino, 3 percent were Caucasian, 65 percent were low income, 10 percent were special needs students, and 3 percent were English language learners. Families in Washington, D.C. have the choice to choose from 52 unique programs at 93 locations throughout the city. 
Offerings include school programs focusing on bilingual immersion, math, science and technology, the performing arts, public policy, character and leadership, Latin and the classics, virtual and online learning, media arts, Montessori, college prep, and a boarding program, among many other options. Every charter school offers open enrollment to any D.C. resident, regardless of their neighborhood or previous academic achievement. Spaces are available on a first-come, first-served basis, and when there are more students interested in, school, in a school than there are spaces available, charter schools must hold a lottery so that every student has an equal opportunity for those spaces. The D.C. Public Charter School Board, the City's independent charter authorizer, recently accepted 19 applications to open new charter schools for fall of 2012. Although parent interest and demand remain high, the growth in charter school opportunities may have begun to plateau. There are a few fewer waiting lists now than there were in years past. However, several of our schools still have hundreds of students on their waiting lists. Charter school performance and accountability from the beginning was clear that the greater autonomy afforded charter schools came with a price of greater accountability for performance. We see the evidence of what these charter school options have meant to students that would otherwise be restricted to their neighborhood schools. We have seen students come from one, two, or three grade levels behind in one school year. We have seen students excel far beyond their grade level and take part in experiences they never imagined possible. We have heard testimony from young African American and Latino male students who have said they would not be alive, much less graduating from high school and going on to college with tens of thousands of dollars in scholarships. Every June, we witness at least 90 percent of the seniors at Thurgood Marshall Academy in Southeast, Washington Math, Science and Technology, Friendship Collegiate, and Cesar Chavez in Northeast, and Maya Angelou and Hospitality in Northwest graduate from high school. Last year, more than 750 students accepted more than $15 million in college scholarships. Many of them were the first in their families to go to college, and many took with them more than $100,000. These are statistics we can support and perpetuate for generations to come. I see my time running, so I will point out that there are consequences to lack of performance. This is uh, mentioned in my written testimony. Uh, I would like to mention before closing that under the able leadership of our new mayor, Vincent Gray, we are now coming together as one city to leverage the strengths and address the weaknesses of both sectors of public education in the city as a whole. These are an array of life-changing options and performance accountability going along with it that we certainly hope this Congress will choose to continue to support. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Edelin. Uh, Mr. Chavis, you were clear, but I'm going to give you another chance to be absolutely crystal clear so we can shatter this facade that supporting the OSP diverts public monies away from the public school system and the charter school system. In your opening statement, um, you addressed that. Can you do it one more time? Does this program divert any money from the public school system or the charter school system? No, it does not. Uh, when we were in discussions about this program, there are a couple of things that are relevant to that, that question. One is we wanted to make sure that we lifted all boats. We recognized that we had to proceed on two tracks, that while you know, D.C. public schools was, was struggling and the D.C. charter school movement was improving, we wanted to make sure that this Federal partnership, this unique Federal partnership, provided funding for those two sectors at the same time that we provided money for the Opportunity Scholarship Program. We also recognized the argument that, it, that, that some people were making that it would take money away. So we held D.C. public schools harmless. So for every child that they lost that went to the program, they still got the per-pupil funding dollars 
to DCP public schools. So at the end of the day, they did not lose dollars when this program was, was started. Which raises the very interesting question and I'll, that, that my colleague from Illinois, Representative Walsh, asked this morning, uh, which is, who are the opponents of this program? And, and what is their motivation? And I know I am asking you to, to assign motives to other people, but uh, you have an experience with this program and the District of Columbia that some of us do not. So if it is not going to divert money and the parents want it and the students want it, where is the opposition? Well, one other thing about the diversion of money, at the end of the day, the students who will be forced to go back to D.C. public schools, it would add money to the bottom line. We have to be mindful of that. Uh, and in terms of the opposition, look, uh, people don't know what they don't know, and, and there is a lot of fear, and there is a lot of other interests to me that trump the interests of what is best for individual children. There is politics. Uh, there's socioeconomic dynamics. There, there's this notion of supporting all only what we know, what we're used to. Uh, I'm of a mind, and I took this position when I became a public official chairing this the education committee on the council, that I would support anything that would help a child or a group of children learn anything, because at the end of the day, when we have an achievement gap in this country between African-American children and children of color and white children that over 30 years has yet to be closed, in spite of all the investment we have put into education, we have to proceed on those two tracks. On the one track, we need to do what we can to improve our public schools, our traditional public schools, so that all children benefit. But on the other hand, we need to make sure that these individual children, like the, one, the two you heard from earlier today, that they have a shot at, at, at this, this piece of American pie. And I'm struck by the, the testimony of one uh, when we had a hearing, a city council hearing on the voucher proposal, scholarship proposal when I was on the council several years ago, by a woman who testified who said she had one child. She said, Mr. Chavis, we have seen you hire some of these new superintendents. And when you hired the previous superintendent, my oldest son was entering seventh grade, and the superintendent said they needed three to five years. Well, the schools didn't get better, and I lost my older son because he was in a bad school. Now my youngest son is about to enter seventh grade, and you have got another new superintendent saying give us another three to five years. I need this program for that reason, because I need help with my child today. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ellen, I want to uh, commend you on the work you have done with the charter school system. And, um, and again, I apologize for my lack of familiarity with all things District of Columbia, but there were opponents to that program when it began, too, weren't there? Yes, sir. There were some opponents to that program. And uh, one of the reasons was that home rule and respect for local political and policy leaders and educators in D.C. seem to have been abrogated by some of the early proponents who went over their heads and went out of their way in some instances to speak disrespectfully to and about them and came to the Congress. And that did result in some resentment among the local people in D.C., political figures, policy figures, and educators, uh, to the fact of the way that it was done. I am happy to say that today much of that early resentment has been ameliorated because the successes are so stunning in some of our schools with the same population of young people everybody in the country is so desperately concerned about. That ach achievement gap has been removed. Those young people do have new chances in a public school setting, a public charter school setting. All right, Ms. North, my time is up, so I am going to ask questions as quickly as I can, and I will give you a, you can answer uh, quickly or not if you want. But uh, my colleague this morning cited another example of an elected official who is um, forced with the, uh, or, or given the, the uh, opportunity, responsibility to make a decision for, uh, for his children. Um, and I am not going to name any names, but um, lots of high-ranking government officials, including members of Congress. I have to make the decision on private school, public school, home school. Uh, why should that only be a decision that rich folk get to make? Well, personally, I don't think that as a, as a parent, 
you should be able to make the decision where you want your child to go. And through the funding sources that a low-income par parent will be able to receive through the Opportunity Scholarship opens that door for them to make that same de decision, that choice that he made, where, he, where his child can go. All right. Thank you. I will uh, now recognize the uh, distinguished uh, gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, and let me thank each one of our witnesses. I find this discussion to be quite intriguing. I have always believed and have always understood that the greatest equalizer that has ever existed in this country is something called public education. That, that public education has been the greatest equalizer that has existed in this country. Mr. Chavis, I am very familiar with your record. I have watched you and observed your work as you were a member of the D.C. Council. I have also been aware of your work in terms of national education reform and the efforts to provide opportunities outside even the District of Columbia, and I commend you for it. As a matter of fact, I was at one of the schools that you have been involved with, though, two weeks ago and had a great time with the students and some of the faculty there. And let me agree with your point when you say that we don't have the will or the courage, because I think that the best way to really improve failing schools, especially schools that are underperforming, is to not only provide a certain amount of resource that they need, but also to promote something that I call serious parental and community involvement. And I think that that I have a school in my congressional district where just yesterday we honored the principal because they have something called, well, there are 90, 90, 90 schools. All of the kids live in what is called the North Lundale community. All of them, more than 90 percent of them, are not only low income, but they all 90 percent are more qualify for food subsidies and free breakfast and subsidized lunch. They right now happen to be the best performing school in the State of Illinois. They, I used to live on the block where they are located. As a matter of fact, the houses on one side of the block were torn down to build the school. I lived in a house on the other side of the block. Some of the fear that some of us have when you start talking about all of the different approaches to education, we don't want to diminish public education because every person has to go through the public systems. They don't have any options about not going to the public systems. And so I appreciate providing opportunities for some students, but I don't want to take away the effort to make sure that every student no matter where he or she might live, have this opportunity for the best education that we can provide for them. And so when you talk about, Mr. Chairman, why some people might appear to be opposed, they're not opposed to education, but they are afraid that there might be some retraction, that there might be some going backwards, that, that, that diminishing a focus on all to the benefit of the few or some may have a tendency to produce that kind of trend. And, and do either one of you have any feeling about that? 
Uh, first of all, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Ranking Member, thank you so much for those comments and, and, um, and your work in terms of helping with schools in Chicago. And you and I know about some of the things you have helped with for those children, and, and that is much appreciated. On that point, this is the analogy I like to use. Um, we really, it pains me what I see happening, not just in D.C. public schools, but traditional public schools around the country. We need to focus on that. But the analogy I use is the house is on fire, and we got to proceed on different tracks. There are firemen who have to go put that fire out, and there are firemen who have to go inside that burning building and pull some of those kids out. And you know what? You may not pull everyone out of that building, but you are going to pull out as many as you can to stabilize the situation and to save lives. The dire deficits of our children, particularly children of color in this country, particularly African American men in this country, where in some cities like the city I grew up in, Indianapolis, 80 percent of the black boys in their high school drop out, in Baltimore, over 70 percent. Because of those deficits that exist, I think, yes, we have got to put the fire out and do what we can to, to restore and improve our public schools, traditional public schools. But by goodness, Mr. Ranking Member, we need to support any and all means that is going to educate even one child. And I don't care if it is charter schools, traditional public schools, if it is scholarship programs, if it is tax credits, if it is magnet schools, if it is specialty schools. I don't care what it is. I really believe that by any means necessary should be by any means necessary when it comes to the children that we are trying to save. And that is my view. And I tell you, I think that these parents you hear from, they have that view. Because when it comes to individual children and individual parents who want the best for their, ch their, their child or their children, they should not be penalized based on zip code. And I think, unfortunately, that is the reality. Um, um, Chairman, I mean, Mr. Davis, um, I, I must say that we, as, um, well, I guess, speaking for the non public school sector, um, we do um, ask for and get assistance from the D.C. public school through the Federal entitlement for the kids who attend our schools. So in return, if, because some of, the, some of the service, because we are small and private, that we can't provide these students, we are still getting assistance through the D.C. public school. So we are not saying that we don't need the D.C. public schools. We are just saying that we need each other. We need each other to find out how and ways of bringing our children and, and raising our children as a community and not just sometimes as an individual. We have to do it as a, as a group. And through this effort, all of us can make it possible for some children and like he said, we might not get all of the kids, but the kids that we do uh, provide the services for, we try to do the best that we can at those given times. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I briefly address the Ranking Member's question? Sure. Uh, Ranking Member Davis, there is a substantial amount of evidence that uh, the pressure of competition from school choice programs actually leads uh, traditional public schools to improve in response and, and generate positive outcomes for students, uh, thus creating a, a rising tide that lifts all boats. And so really the idea of, of expanding choice and improving public education is, is really a false choice. Uh, the two can and often do work in close tandem. If I could also, Mr. Chairman, just quickly, the charter schools in D.C. explicitly through our association seek to find out what works, for whom, under what conditions, and to share best practices with DCPS and with other urban public school systems around the country. That is one of our explicit goals, to benefit all of the children. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I thank the, uh, the gentleman, and I would recognize now the gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar. Yes, thank you very, very much. And I, I hear a common um, denominator here involving parents and, and, and making that a success story. With that being said, um, Dr. Adelin, do you support um, the multi-prong aspect that is currently going on in D.C. 
um, fullheartedly in the education of our children. Um, Dr. Kosar, I am here as Executive Director of the D.C. Association of Chartered Public Schools, and my message is about the charter schools here today. When we are talking about the education of children and being science-based, um, outcomes are, are everything. Um, wouldn't we acknowledge that we have a fundamental um, mechanism that is actually working here, and wouldn't we want to acknowledge uh, support for that uh, scholarship type program? We support everything that is working to bring a quality education to the children of D.C. The only evidence I can speak to directly is that of the chartered public schools. If you are trying to get results based from the charter schools, have you not reached out to the private schools to find out what is working for them? Actually, I did. In my first year in this role, I reached out to the independent and private schools to find out how they do evaluation and assessment, because improving school quality is one of the primary pillars of the work of our association. So I have reached out to them. I have also reached out to high-performing DCPS schools and to other sources around the country for information about best practices. Would you, success, would you say then in a follow-up that they are a success, a, success, a success model? That I cannot attest to myself. I can attest to the quality of the charter schools myself. And I also have reached out to our public charter school board, the authorizer, to get uh, data they can stand behind with respect to the excellence of the schools and the shortcomings of the schools. Yes, so I can speak to charter schools. Well, I am finding this frustrating because as a dentist I am working on the premise of, of treatments that work um, and, and repetitions. And so I am frustrated by seeing the modalities of vertical learning and not going horizontally to, to instill and work with um, parts of education systems that are working. And I find it frustrating that I see your educational model going vertical and not including those, um, the dialogue horizontally with all the rest of the educators. Is that a fair assumption? Uh, with all respect, sir, I would say no. I have reached out, and I think the charter schools um, singularly seek collaboration in D.C. across all lines as far as quality and best practices are concerned. We have made every effort to form what I call a seamless collaboration across all the sectors so that all the children of D.C. can get the benefit of the best of what is known. It is not always reciprocated, but we will keep trying. Last question for you. Um, have you been benefited from the voucher system from to the, uh, to the uh, uh, charter schools? And this has been a financial as well as a, an educational uplift based upon that program. I am not aware of any financial uh, implications for charter schools. I may be wrong about that, but I am not aware of any financial implications. And I have not been the recipient of, though I have asked, any best practices or any information about what is working with particular groups of children as we are sorting out within the charter schools with the express intention of sharing that information with all of the school systems of involving our children. Uh, there is a crisis in this country with children of color from impoverished backgrounds and their learning, and we are actively engaged in sh finding out what works and sharing it. And I cannot say that we have been the recipients of similar kind of outreach. Well, have you not received $104 million in regards to that um, because of the three-sector approach? from the Federal funding? Yes. Uh, over three years would that be a figure? I am not aware of one since, year's worth. Since its inception? I don't have that figure since its inception. I do know charter schools, as, as uh, a part of the three-sector approach, have received funding at least from three years I have been with the organization. Yes, sir, they have. Thank you very much. I yield my time. Thank you, Dr. Gozar. We would now recognize the general lady from the District of Columbia, Representative Holmes Norton. Um, my, my, my questions are mainly directed to Dr. Wolf. I do want to um, thank everyone for your testimony. It is very important testimony for our record. Um, I, don't want, I want to correct um, the record, Mr. Chavis, where you said that somehow there was double funding, that they were held, D.C. public schools were held 
harmless. To the contrary, these, when, when that money travels with the child. So if, if a child leaves the D.C. public school system and goes to a charter school, that per pupil funding goes uh, to uh, the charter school. And that, Mr. Wolf, is the only circumstance in which competition occurs, because then the public schools are competing not only for the child, but for the same funding. That is not the case with private schools. There is no competition with private schools uh, because you don't have that nexus to fund funding. To my colleagues, I want to say the mantra on the other side that, that you have said to my, my constituents, every child deserves a private school choice. If that is your view, why have you not brought a private school bill to the floor of the House so that every child, including the children in your district, can get a private school choice? That is, and instead, you are ripping money from the public schools of the District of Columbia. Mr. Wolf, and of the United States of America, Mr. Wolf, uh, according to the Department of Education's final report, on the Opportunity Scholarship Program, 2010, June, just a few months ago, issued. Here I am quoting, there was no evidence that the Opportunity Scholarship Program affected student achievement as measured by standardized reading and math tests. If that is the case, how can you claim that education attainment was enhanced, uh, uh, given this official r report from the government? Uh, Representative Norton, educational attainment is distinct from educational achievement. Educational achievement refers to performance on, on assessments and test scores. Educational attainment refers to how far a child goes in the educational system, their attainment of years of schooling, their attainment of, of educational degrees. And that is the important distinction. Well, I can understand that distinction, but you do understand. But first, let me say, do the children in the private school program uh, take the same standardized tests as the students in these, at DCPS? Uh, Representative Norton, for purposes of our evaluation, they did take the same test that was central to our evaluation. It was the test. They did not take the same tests, performance tests, that the children in the D.C. public schools have to take every year. <coughs> Representative Norton, they did initially. It was written into the law that we had to use the same assessments used by D.C. public schools at the year <coughs> of enactment of the law, and that was the SAT-9. Later, uh, DCPS changed and adopted a criterion reference test, but we continued to administer the uh, specified test to both the uh, OSP students and the control well, uh, well, the answer to my question is no. They do not take and have not taken the same standardized test. And our school, the charter schools do take the same standardized test. So that when you hear comparisons, the comparisons I have made, those are real comparisons with real students and indeed with students who were often of, of a lower economic level than the students in the D.C. public schools. Now, you say that there was, in, uh, in your testimony, uh, 12 percentage points higher graduation rates uh, of students in the private schools from students in the public schools. Are you aware that the uh, Charter school students have a 25 percent uh, better graduation rates than children in the D.C. public schools. Well, how would you account for that difference? Uh, Representative Norton, I am not familiar with that particular study, but one-third of the students in our control group were actually in D.C. charter schools, and they contributed to the overall average graduation rate of 70 percent for our control group. The OSP students when you factor out uh, those who never used their scholarships, graduated at a 91 percent rate. Uh, figures don't lie. And though the figures from the D.C., if, if, I, was if I was going, to, uh, go, going to, to try to find a place for my kid, I would look at these figures um, very carefully. Could I ask you what percentage of, of children were, were sent back or, or left the private schools uh, to return to the D.C. public schools? Uh, Representative Norton, by the end of our evaluation, which was six years into the initial launch of the program, 
about half of the students offered scholarships uh, in the first two years were still in uh, a, a private school. So there was, was a 50, 50 percent dropout rate? That is correct. From, from, from the From the program, yes. Uh, what percentage of the students were from the, that you, you the, were, in the schools were from the lowest performing schools in the District of Columbia? Representative Norton, 44 percent of the students uh, in the sample that we studied were, uh, were attending schools in need of improvement at the point of, of uh, applying to the OSB. Where were the, uh, where, where, so where were the rest? The general lady's time has expired. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. We will now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. First of all, I want to thank all of you for your testimony. And, um, Dr. Elon, I, I want to, <clears throat> having uh, served on a charter school board in my daughter's school, one of the things that, um, and, I, and I have people come up to me quite often and ask about charter schools and should they be, start one, how, how do they start one. And I tell them that it is not a simple process and that they need to have certain elements on that board or else they are going to fail. And, they, and, and I think a lot of people underestimate all that it takes to, you got to have some business people, you got to have some fundraising people, you got to have some people who know that it is a corporation, you got to have some people who know something about education. And so how do you all um, maximize the likelihood that your charter schools will be successful? Thank you, Mr. Cummings. And be brief, because I had a number of questions. You are absolutely right. The, the D.C. Public Charter School Board has learned a lot in its 11-year uh, life as the authorizer. And the processes for making application, going through the review process, having the public meetings, and having a, ch a, a charter agreement accepted or not have undergone great change based on precisely what you are saying. Governance is key. Fiscal management is absolutely crucial. These are all nonprofit organizations that enter into a contract with their authorizer, which is called a charter. But there are lots of other parts, including getting right down to the curriculum and the scope and sequence and who will be performing this work and what are the qualifications of the leadership as well as those they will be bringing in to teach. It is very much a serious business. Now, you heard Mr. Chavis, and Ms. Chavis, I want to thank you for your testimony because it is very compelling. And I understand the individual, I understand everybody else, too. And, um, <clears throat> Dr. Elin, when you hear the testimony of Mr. Chavis, and you, you heard the testimony of the parents and the young people earlier, I mean, what, what do you say to them? I know you are here with regard to charter schools. But what do you say to them when Mr. Chavis says, you know, this kid, and I have used that argument myself, that this kid has got one chance to be in the first grade, this is it, and one chance to be in the second grade. And if they fail to get what they need, it is not just for that moment, but it is for a lifetime that they can be held back. <clears throat> so what, I mean, what do you say to that? I am just curious. I say that in the District of Columbia we have 53 charter schools on 93 campuses that are working very, very hard every day to provide a quality education for every child that can get in. I do realize that not every child gets in in a given year, but our chances of growing and our viability and our sustainability create enormous potential, and I am doing everything, Mr. Cummings, in my power to make them the best schools they can possibly be. So, so but, but in the meantime, so we have waiting lists, at, waiting lists at most of those schools? Actually, we do not have waiting lists at most of those schools at this moment in time. We have had, but we are now beginning just about to plateau. There are some schools that have hundreds of students on the waiting list, but for the most part, it is not the case that most of our charter schools have waiting lists right now. There is room in charter schools for most of the children in D.C. to get a good public school education. There is no doubt about it that parental involvement is very significant in any school and the achievement of young people. At the charter school where we, uh, our kids went, 
they, there was a requirement that each parent had to volunteer at least something like 70 hours uh, per year. That's a lot of time. And my, the kids had a real advantage in having a congressman because I taught politics. <laughs> so they got, a, they got a, a course in politics and law. And um, but I'm just wondering, is it, are those those you have those kind of requirements in, in many of the charter schools ask parents to sign a pledge of commitment and the students as well, mm. because creating a culture in a building is key to its success. I can't say though, Mr. Cummings, I've known any child or parent to be dismissed from a school for failure to do that. But there there is an expectation there, a very high standard there that they are asked to buy into, yes. Just one quick thing. I would suggest that you all take a look at that, because I found, uh, Mr. Chairman, that, that that involvement is so significant, because it gets, I mean, having parents in the school makes a humongous, I mean, just tremendous difference. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. And, uh, it might be well if you would go teach politics and law at all the schools in all of our jurisdictions. I, for one, would love to have you in South Carolina. Uh, we would now recognize the uh, distinguished gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for conducting uh, this hearing. Uh, and I would also like the ranking member to come to my district to teach <laughs> politics, too. Uh, let me, let me um, talk about my district first, Missouri, uh, the St. Louis Public Schools. And right now, a debate is raging uh, in the Missouri legislature about uh, private school vouchers and just how much uh, we take from public schools to create these private school vouchers. Uh, and, and we can get into the issue of whether that's fair or not, uh, whether it is a viable option uh, for parents and students. Uh, and we can talk about that if, if we have time. But I know it would take thousands of dollars from each student uh, and, and would have a devastating effect on the uh, St. Louis Public School. Um, and um, let me start off with, with, with Dr. Adlin, and thank you for your ex excellent testimony regarding the history and growth of D.C. charter schools. And I'm interested in several parts of your testimony. One is, uh, Doctor, can you give us your assessment and examples of graduation rates at some of the area charter schools? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Um, and, and I did include some of that in the testimony. What I did was average it out, and, it, and, and in some of our schools in every sector of the city, southeast, northeast, northwest, we have at least 90 percent. But I want you to know that some of those schools are as high as 96 and 97 percent, well above the national average of high school graduation and going to school with millions of dollars in college scholarships. Okay, so, so they, and they, they do go on to college, and, yes, they, sir. and they are prepared for college. How are the reading levels and the math uh, levels? If you, th this is something I would like to make very clear. The District of Columbia has some excellent traditional public schools, particularly in the affluent wards. We also have schools that are selective in that you have to audition and you have to have a certain grade point average in order to get in. But if you hold, take those off the table, the affluent schools and the selective schools, and you just look at the schools that serve poor children of color, the charter schools outperform DCPS two to one with respect to reading and math by the time they get to middle and high school. And, and you know that through the assessment? The only thing we have to go you, by is the year-end test. I don't think that is adequate. I'm, I personally am a proponent of looking at growth gains in children, and I hope that the ESEA reauthorization will look more at growth gains. But right now, that is all we have to look at, yes. Now, would, would you be able to supply the committee with uh, statistics on, uh, on 
matriculation and college acceptance? Yes, sir. I would, would be, be happy to. to I can't do it here and now, but I'd be happy to. Yes, sir. In writing, I, we would appreciate it. Sir. Uh, let, me, let me ask Mr. Chavis, um, tell me about um, how D.C. charter schools stack up to uh, D.C. public schools. If you had to choose one or the other for your children, which one would it be? Well, you know, what I did for my children was uh, looked at individual schools. I wasn't focused on a system or private versus public as much as what fit the best educational needs of my individual children. And I think that is what parents look to have happen for them as well. Uh, traditionally, you know, I, I hear all this talk about charter schools. I, I have to say parenthetically that, you know, scholarships and vouchers are charter schools' best friends. Because when, when I started, when I was chairing the Education Committee and I started charter schools or helped push charter school funding, I was getting worn out by a lot of people who now are talking about charter schools like they are doing great work. And I think that is progress, I, I, because people now understand that pr providing options and choice matters. I think, as, as Dr. Eatlin knows, Charter schools have generally outperformed D.C. public schools uh, across the board. Uh, but at the end of the day, when it comes down to parents having choices, you know, in this global, multifaceted technological age, we need to give more choices to parents, not less. More matters. I mean, this is a situation where we need to we need to recognize that children respond to different learning modalities, and and but the problem is that rubs up against our historical perspective, where we're locked into this one size fits all paradigm that is a cookie cutter approach that you matriculate a certain way according to age and divide it according to class size and all this stuff. Well, at the end of the day, the learning that we know is going to take place over the next 20, 30 years is going to be wholly unlike anything any of us in this room can relate to. So I think, to answer your question, I think charter schools have generally done well because they look at things more with a forward lens and it is more uh, innovative and creative in its, in its output. And in terms of how it relates to this, to this hearing, that is why we we promoted this three-sector strategy so that we would have a whole host of options for parents to choose from. Okay. Thank you for your response. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I thank the gentleman. Uh, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank this panel for your uh, professionalism, for your expertise, frankly, for your collegiality towards uh, one another and towards uh, this subcommittee. Uh, we will be adjourned, and I would uh, ask the four if you can uh, linger for about 30 seconds, I know some of us would like to come thank you in person. Thank you, sir. This meeting is adjourned.